All right. So, my name is Ming Nguyen. Uh, I have been contributing to OpenStreetMap for uh, several years, and uh, I've been contributing under um, this really creative username. Um, so I recently started working for Mapbox. Uh, I don't actually get paid to map. Um, I am helping to develop the next generation of open source uh, map frameworks uh, for native iOS and Android apps. So if you or your users happen to be uh, Apple fanboys, go check it out. We just released a new release uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and you know, it's like really smooth and fast and stuff. Uh, but um, somehow I convinced these folks to uh, let me come to uh, state of the map to talk about my hobby, which uh, is mapping hot air balloons, giant hot air balloons in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'll get back to that in a moment. That probably makes no sense right now, but I'll get back to it. Uh, so this is the part of the talk where I give a savvy story about how I got addicted to OpenStreetMap. Um, and, uh, and it all started in April 2008. I was in college subsisting on pickles and ramen, just like all college students do. And, uh, and finals were a few hours away, so I um, you know, needed to cram and all that. And so, of course, I did the expedient thing and logged into OpenStreetMap and completely yeah, blew that off. Um, and uh, and I, when I logged into OpenStreetMap, um, the very first thing I did was something that uh, you know, most of you probably did when you first discovered the site, which was to zoom in and in and in and in until you reach your hometown. In this case, uh, I reached uh, Loveland, Ohio, population uh, 12,000. And uh, I mean, it is a boring place, but not this boring. Um, so yeah, this is actually what it looked like. Uh, I took a, a screenshot way back when. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's got roads. It's got roads. Um, and, uh, and pretty much at this point, uh, and especially, you know, uh, I'm sure at this point, some of you have, have already uh, heard about uh, how we got to this point um, from the previous talk here. But um, yeah, so pretty much the whole US looked like this. Uh, it was just roads imported from a US government database called Tiger, um, developed by the Census Department to help census workers go door to door. Um, but maybe not quite uh, you know, the best thing for, uh, you know, not quite the most appropriate thing for what uh, a lot of people were using OpenStreet, more would want to use OpenStreetMap for. Um, so TIGER, like a lot of government things, is an acronym. Uh, it stands for Topologically Integrated Geographic Encoding Referencing. Um, and despite all those fancy words, uh, it has some issues. Um, this is a lost pavement road, which is not actually on pavement. Um, so there's, there's a lot of you know, offset issues. Um, neighborhoods that don't look at all like they're supposed to you know, in, in real life. Um, disconnected ways. Uh, there are roads that exist in Tiger, but not in the real world, and vice versa. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it, it sounds really bad, but when you think about um, how things were before Tiger, uh, it was a blank slate. And, um, I don't know, at least for some people, you know, you zoom into your hometown, and if you see nothing but a blank, just land, just blank, um, you know, you start to wonder, am I really going to uh, spend my entire life drawing roads? Uh, probably not. So, um, so this was kind of uh, an attempt to seed the map, um, much as a street musician might seed their guitar case with some cash to, you know, get, encourage people to pitch in and, uh, and fill that up. So uh, the hope was that, you know, eventually people would fill up the guitar case. And um, the bad news is actually these photos I've been showing you are current OSM data. Um, this is 2015. Uh, uh, against um, roughly uh, imagery from what, roughly one or two years ago, and uh, so you can see, um, you know, uh, there are there are definitely uh, weak spots here. Um, now, to be fair, um, the OpenStreetMap community in the U.S. has spent the last uh, several years working very very tirelessly to correct and improve Tiger data, um, but uh, you know, clearly some parts are, some parts of the country are being left behind, and um, and so. Uh, you know, we, um, we have, you know, we have a term for areas like this. Uh, it's called a tiger desert. Oh, sorry, that's a typo. It should be tiger desert. You know, it's only 10 o'clock and I'm already thinking about food. This is not good. Um, and, uh, and so um, tiger desert is a term that uh, Martin uh, coined uh, a few years back um, uh, just to kind of draw attention to the fact that these areas are getting left behind. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thing is that 
even if we were really on our game and we uh, in completely uh, revamped all this street data and got it all perfect, all we'd wind up with is a perfect tiger. But that's more than what this project is about. I mean, that, the, our project is a lot more uh, than, than uh, you know, perfect tiger data, perfect street data. Um, and yet, uh, when, a, when someone first visits the site and they see the name open street map and they zoom into their hometown and see streets and then they click the edit button and all they see is streets, it kind of reinforces the notion that that's all this is about. That's as creative as we're going to get as a project. And so um, if you're someone who drives on roads but don't really care to create a perfect schematic of it, um, you kind of feel left out. You can't feel like this is not really the place for me. Um, and so uh, among the things that we've done as a US community um, is uh, just periodic um, contests and things like this. So, so this is uh, um, the big baseball project. We, we did this in 2011. Um, a contest is to see who could uh, map the most baseball fields in the US uh, leading up to the World Series that year. And um, by October, we had uh, OpenStreetMap as a whole had mapped um, some 14,000 baseball fields. Uh, now, you know, so this is not like an import. This is, this is people going and manually finding baseball fields and drawing them in. Um, and what's great about baseball fields is, uh, well, you can see um, they're pretty well distributed. Um, they're, they're not just in the urban centers where you know, a lot of uh, OpenStreetMap mappers tend to live. Um, and over time, you know, past, past this contest, a lot of us have gotten in the habit of mapping uh, baseball fields just as a matter of course. Um, and so you, you see kind of um, these manual uh, edits uh, spreading out. Um, what's also great about baseball fields is they stand out. Um, you know, you, you, if you've got someone uh, zooming into their hometown or even the town next door, uh, they'll probably spot one of these. Uh, baseball fields tend to show up at about zoom level 13 and, and greater. So, um, you know, you might see one of these and then realize, oh, wait, no, there's, there's uh, something next to it. There's like a soccer field next to that, a playground next to that. Actually, this is like a part of a school campus, so, you know, may maybe I should map the whole school. And before you know it, someone's gotten hooked on OpenStreetMap. That's the hope, at least. And, um, and so, um, you know, that, that's kind of uh, what this talk is about. This talk is about finding um, hooks that we can use to capture people's attention. Uh, beyond just the promise of open data that they might not necessarily have a use for at the time. Um, and uh, so uh, baseball fields aren't the only thing you can do um, to capture people's attention. Uh, here you, we have some, uh, uh, some power lines. Um, two of them have uh, the pylons uh, mapped. So like every individual uh, high voltage tower is, is, map, is shown on the map. Um, and then the third here has no, has no dots, and uh, that's actually um, from Tiger. Uh, Tiger came with some power lines too, but they were all disconnected and jumbled and whatnot. And um, t uh, so mapping, uh, mapping power lines is a little bit more um, tedious than mapping baseball fields, but it has a much larger impact. Um, with one power line, you can, uh, you can cover the whole state from end to end with some line, and then people wonder, like, what is this thing? And then they kind of like go to uh, one end or the other, the power line to the substations or whatever, and and uh, and you know, so so this kind of like shows uh, the possibility that you know we're not just about about streets, we're about all kinds of infrastructure. Um, and so um, you know, we've got people who in the OSM community who are doing things like mapping you know pipelines and um, other kinds of infrastructure that um, you know, I don't know if they got hooked from seeing power lines, but uh, it's definitely not out of the question now to map other kinds of infrastructure. Um, and then uh, I promise I'll get back to this. This is actually that hot air balloon I showed you earlier, um, but in OpenStreetMap, uh, the uh, OSM Cardo style sheet as opposed to inside of an editor. And, um, and yeah, it's actually a corn maze. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, this, is, uh, this is a corn maze. Uh, some farmer has mowed, mowed a path through his cornfield, uh, and, and you know it's like it's a labyrinth. Uh, they charge for admission. Usually uh, have it open until sometime uh, uh, November-ish, and uh, it's a lot of fun. You should try it. Um, 
But uh, there, there, are, there is one problem with mapping corn mazes, as I discovered. Um, that, uh, that corn maze I showed you, um, it says uh, 2001 to 2010 on the bottom there. And uh, that's actually the vintage of that, of that design. They change it up every year. And uh, unfortunately, the aerial imagery that we have to, cha to trace off of does not change every year. Um, but uh, even so, um, you know, my hope is that people see this very large feature in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's got dotted lines everywhere. You really can't miss it when you're, when you're in, the rural, in rural areas. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like it says 2010, it's clearly out of date. Um, this is actually, I, I updated this last night because I realized it was out of date, it said 2010. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so uh, this is still out of date by a couple of years because the aerial imagery is out of date. But a local mapper might see that, know about, uh, know about either the corn maze or the new, new design or whatever, and they might go and field survey uh, as they, uh, as they you know, try to get from end to end. Um, uh, so the, the other thing that we can do to kind of hook mappers is, uh, is draw buildings. Now, um, the previous talk here, uh, uh, Alan's talk focused primarily on uh, urban areas, and, and if you haven't noticed, my talk is mainly about uh, kind of small towns and the rural areas that have tended to get left behind in Tiger Fix Up. And so these, these areas don't tend to have um, the kind of uh, promise of ginormous open data, data sets being released to the public. Um, but they do have um, individuals uh, in the community who, who probably have seen that um, they've been left behind by, um, by a lot of uh, m mapping concerns. So um, aerial imagery to, for their town doesn't get updated as often, street view doesn't get updated as often, and, and so um, the promise here is we can show people that, yeah, we haven't forgotten about your town. Um, and so what you have here is, uh, is a few buildings, uh, you have a few buildings in the main drag of town, uh, and you have like an industrial park on the, on the side. Uh, not, not a comprehensive building layer, but it's enough to show people that, yeah, OpenStreetMap is about your town, too. Um, and, um, and there's a couple of strategies beyond what you, sh what you see here um, that you can do. Uh, and one case in point is, um, so this is uh, Covington, Kentucky today, and you can see it has a comprehensive building layer. Uh, now, this is an urban area, but um, I, I have a friend who, uh, who, went, uh, who was trying to make a map of this town and got frustrated that only like, the main street had buildings. So he like, went out and tried to spread things out and uh, mapped one or two buildings for every block. And that just looked really weird. And so some, uh, some other, other mapper came by later on, um, thought that looked really weird, and compulsively just filled in everything else for the entire county. Um, <laughs> So that's how you wind up with a really good data set. This is all traced in ID, manually. Um, and uh, that's actually, this is actually my favorite example. This is the uh, rural town of Brookville, Ohio. Um, and it, it too has a comprehensive building layer. Uh, but not only that, I don't know if you can see that uh, on the screen there, but not only does it have buildings, uh, every single house, it has all the driveways leading to those houses. It has parking lots for all the apartments in town. It has all the playgrounds in town. And all that happened because um, you know, one person uh, mapped a couple buildings on the outskirts of town, like some big box stores, and I think maybe added some playgrounds to a, a park. And then someone uh, who had formerly been a map maker user, a uh, Google map maker user, uh, came and saw that and like, well, why not, why not all the buildings in town? Why not all the driveways in town? And uh, you know, this is like without any kind of, uh, of push at all. Just, just seeing this on the map. Um, and, uh, and so that's really encouraging. Um, you know, we, we, what we need are not only a lot of mappers, we don't need just uh, a lot of data, but we also need a lot of passionate local mappers who will, um, will take, it, take ownership of their part of the map. Um, so at this point, um, you're probably wondering, okay, but you know, this is great, these are two examples, like it's anecdotal, how does it scale? Um, it, you know, like, uh, how am I, what's the best use of my time trying to uh, seed the entire U.S. With, uh, with baseball fields and random things? And um, the answer I have is that we can make this more efficient, um, if, if you so desire, by, uh, by doing things like querying, um, querying the data for um, uh, signs of um, places that might give you a lot of oomph. So, here you have an open pass turbo query uh, for helipads. Um, and uh, what's interesting about helipads is they tend to be located next to really big buildings. Um, hospitals, 
uh, police headquarters, big giant factories, and um, you map the big building next to the helipad, and suddenly you've got something that's visible from zoom level 12 or 13, and, um, and that uh, kind of broadcasts the ambitions of OSM a lot farther. Um, and, uh, and here's a URL for Overpass Turbo, if you aren't aware. Um, it's, it's got its own query language. Um, it is uh, fairly fast, but uh, you can also, uh, it, it, it gives you a lot of uh, uh, rope to hang yourself with if you're, uh, if you're not careful with uh, how you structure the query. Um, oops. Okay, so um, the, uh, the point of this whole exercise is not just to grow the map, but to also grow the mappers, who will in turn grow the map. Um, this, is, this is all about, you know, uh, in the tech industry, this is term force multiplication, and it's a fancy term for basically having other people do your work. Um, and, uh, and this is really important because, you know, we're only, we've only got so many mappers in the U.S. Um, but, you know, if you look back at, um, you know, this picture here, I mean, each of those houses has someone who can be a mapper. So um, growing the mappers is not just about hanging a shingle out there and, and telling them, hey, there's, there's an open data project, feel free to fill it up. Um, it's also about engaging them. Um, you know, there's, there's, a phenomenon, there's a large phenomenon of people who do their drive-by edit of their house or whatever, something that they really care deeply about, but don't go further than that. Um, and uh, what we need to do is, as we go and seed the map, we also need to keep track of where we've seeded the map and, um, and look for people who have, uh, who have picked up the torch. Um, welcome them. You know, uh, encourage them. Uh, express how happy we are to see locals, because this is a big country. And um, most likely, they probably tagged everything totally wrong. Um, but we have to be positive, of course. And you know, actually, here's how you do this. And don't worry about it. Everyone does it the first time. And um, most importantly, ask me how to, how, ask me how to tag anything, anything. Because um, chances are they have some interest beyond streets. Um, you know, it, it could be very, very random. Might, maybe no one has thought of it yet. But just the, the um, interaction with the mapper about trying to figure out how it's best to go about um, tagging this stuff um, kind of gets them uh, involved in the, in, in the processes that we take for granted uh, about tagging in OSM and contributing. Um, so um, this is the end of my talk. Uh, I really thank you for, for taking the time to listen. Um, and uh, for the benefit of those watching this on video, um, there are related sessions by um, Alan, McC Alan McConkey, who just presented here in this room earlier, uh, Sterling Quinn yesterday, and also Kristen Cam yesterday. Um, uh, are also related to the idea of um, uh, growing the map in, uh, in, in areas that um, haven't gotten as much attention in the past. Um, and uh, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. I'm a little bit early, but um, hopefully you guys have questions to fill the time. Yes? Have you considered uh, archiving historic corn mazes in open historic map? That is a great idea. Uh, so the, the question uh, is, uh, for the benefit of those uh, watching on video, is uh, have we considered uh, archiving historic uh, designs of corn mazes in open historical map? And uh, that is a great idea. I had not thought of that before. Um, you know, these are, these are uh, not exactly the most ephemeral things. I mean, they last for a year. And, uh, and that would be great. Um, that would be a, a great hook into an additional project. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, actually like reaching those people's those people in those houses? Like, how do they, how do they know about OpenStreetMap? How um, do they so the find question, us? Sorry. How do they find us? Uh, so the question was, yeah, how how do uh, how do people in all these uh, these houses in the rural areas find us in the first place? Um, and uh, the answer is, we drop leaflets on them. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, you know, this is, this is something that, um, you know, we have to think about uh, as far as getting, uh, getting the project uh, aware, to, you know, getting awareness of uh, OpenStreetMap uh, to the general public. Um, and um, part of that is through, uh, we need, you know, we need a killer app, right? We need, 
we need uh, clients to use OpenStreetMap for things that, um, that really reach the general public. And, um, and uh, I think it was Sterling Quinn yesterday who, who pointed out that um, you know, one of these killer apps is Craigslist. Craigslist uh, shows, um, shows the uh, you know, OpenStreetMap uh, data with all the, with all the you know, uh, listings that people have put in. And um, this is not something that people only, you know, only in urban areas uh, use. This is something in you know, rural Pennsylvania and stuff. Um, and so um, we, need, we need killer apps like that to draw people into OSM. Um, and you know, it could be as simple as you know, they're, they're putting their listing Craigslist and they notice that there are buildings. Uh, and they didn't expect to see buildings because um, another, you know, uh, you know, mapping site had never included buildings for the town before, and things like that. Yes, in the back there. Yeah, that's you. Sorry. Oh. It's on now. Okay. Yes. Um, I was just curious if you've spoken to any of some of the people you've referred to as as the locals or the the like everyday people of these local communities and if you've identified any potential barriers to entry with editing mm -hmm. or like you mentioned that you know we need to be accessible to people to show people how it's done or like how to tag things but have you actually been in contact with people that are interested or yeah uh, so um in my experience, I've done a lot of this mapping in uh, kind of a swath of uh, um, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, that part of the Midwest. And, um, and I've, I've reached out to some mappers I've seen in the past, especially, of course, when they make tagging mistakes, I want to correct them and things like that. Um, and um, I think my only gripe about the, the kind of the onboarding process right now is that uh, um, the communication channels are really, uh, really, um, dis like just very disparate communication channels. Um, you, you start out with OSM and then, um, you know, very quickly, you're kind of, you know, you we basically have to tell people uh, within, within a you know, few days or whatever that maybe it makes sense to join the mailing list. But then that's its whole can of worms, right? I mean, I don't know if you've, you've seen any of the OSM mailing lists, but uh, some of them are very high volume. Some of them are, um, there's just a lot of, you know, politicking and things like that, um, that can really turn off someone who's just interested in their, in their little neck of the woods. Um, uh, but I, I would say that, um, you know, talking to some of these people, um, they have very, they have very varied interests. Um, like I, uh, I've been in touch with like one person. So there's like, you know, of course there's, there's just p related people who, who, um, just care about geography in general, and they want to you know, see, see what, what's up here. Um, there's people who um, just want to see their town represented well everywhere they look. So the person who uh, I showed you earlier, uh, the, in Brookville, Ohio, where they had drawn all the driveways, um, they had previously been a map maker user, uh, and then they switched to OpenStreetMap to map there. And their motive wasn't so much uh, about open data. It was more about just making sure that whatever was showing Brookville showed Brookville well. Um, and that's still the kind of passion that we, that we need in the, in the project. Um, and uh, um, I, I, think it's, I think it speaks well that we're drawing people from, from varied backgrounds. Um, yeah, uh, I, uh, I encountered one person who was, uh, who was happy that, they, they, that OpenStreetMap would allow them to, to tag their uh, bike polo field. And I didn't even know what a bike polo court was. Um, but that was a thing, and they were very happy that it existed. Uh, did that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>